I welcome you to the 2020 Franciscan Zoom Lectures, hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Our presenter tonight, Stephen J. McMichael, OFM Conventual, is an associate professor in the Theology Department at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he teaches courses on medieval theology and Christian Muslim dialogue. He published a book entitled The Glory of Paradise, Risen Life in the Easter Octave Sermons of Bernard Bernardino da Siena, Tau Press 2016. He is publishing a book this spring on the Mary Magdalene in Medieval Franciscan Theology, Spirituality, and Art, Franciscan Institute. He is currently researching and writing on the topic of the resurrection of Jesus in late medieval Franciscan theology, spirituality, and preaching, focusing currently on the resurrection theology of 15th century Franciscan Roberto de Lecce. I welcome Friar Stephen J. McMichael. As you can tell, uh, my life has been, at least, um, well, for many years now, has been dealt with the reality of eschatology. And I just want to start by talking about a little bit of my own journey towards this. Uh, since the 1980s, I've been to doing tours of the Basilica of St. Francis. And never once, I believe, did I enter the chapel of Mary Magdalene. And because I've been working on this resurrection theology and uh, sermons and so forth, I, I recognize that Mary Magdalene was the main resurrection witness. But I got directed towards Mary Magdalene and that chapel by the late Janet Robson. I uh, still mourn her loss because she wrote an article many years ago about what she believed is what a 14th century pilgrim would have experienced in the basilica, especially the lower basilica, which I'm going to take you on a journey for. And, and therefore, during the pandemic and some other time, based on her work and uh, many others, I, I've been working on this book, which you, I believe you see the title, um, is actually Mary Magdalene and Medieval Franciscan Spirituality, Beloved Disciple and Apostle of Apostles. You have the title below. And so I'm going to take you through a little journey here of my own experience during this pandemic and some other things of really having the time finally to write this book, which I intended to do for the last couple of years. Uh, this is actually the, you can see in your screen, the chapters of the book. I actually uh, have been dealing mostly with Vita Christi tradition uh, text. These are from Bonaventure's Tree of Life until actually uh, Isabella Viena, she is a poor Claire sister, working in the late 15th century in Valencia. And, um, and so I'm looking at this Vita Christi tradition in relation to, to medieval art. And by the way, you notice, and I will conclude this by bringing together Mary Magdalene and the mother of Jesus together. So that's the, uh, the prize that happens in uh, chapter seven. This is what I do with my students. Actually, I go through the New Testament and uh, go through all of this. I believe you can see my, my pointer here. These are the different Marys that are there. There are many, as uh, many of you know, there are many Marys there. The, really the conflation that I'm operating with, and this was the medieval view, was is that it brought together Mary Magdalene of the garden scene of Easter Sunday with the penitent woman of Luke 7 and of Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha, and Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus scene. Of course, we've got always before us, we've got the Da Vinci Code. And... Um, I am a, I, I just watched this actually about a month ago to kind of go over this. And this is a very, what he presents is a very Gnostic thing. Um, as a, a, an, another scholar who writes on Mary Magdalene said, um, Dan Brown did not understand the medieval approach to Mary Magdalene. In fact, uh, what he does in the Da Vinci Code is make Mary Magdalene another a goddess. We already have a goddess in Mary the Mother. We don't need another one. And what I'm going to present to you is what the medievals, I, what my images of what they're doing is for the medievals, they are making Mary Magdalene a model of discipleship that leads to ultimately union with 
with God in this encounter with Christ. And so we move on from the Da Vinci Code. Of course, uh, if any of you want to see this movie, actually, this movie is uh, very good. There's some really great scenes in here, but it's very much this Gnostic vision, which is not what the medievals had. Owe it to Gregory the Great, you see um, here an image of being inspired. I don't know if it means he was inspired to actually conflate Mary Mag these various uh, Marys that into Mary Magdalene here, but we owe it to him because of um, Jacobus of Veragina in the 1260s. This is the same time that Bonaventure is writing and Thomas Aquinas, I always try to point that out to my students, that he's writing this uh, massive text called The Golden Legend. And in that legend, he's got this story of Mary Magdalene. And he is the one who accepts, as others had done, he's not the only one, but he accepts this conflation of this penitent woman, the woman uh, Mary of, of the sister of Martha and Lazarus and the raising of Lazarus and this woman in the garden. And so, we are now going to go to Assisi. I, I presume many of you have been there. So this is an image, of course, of that. And we are going to be going into the lower basilica here because uh, this is where this Mary Magdalene Chapel is located. And uh, this is a ground plan for this. This is the upper basilica, as uh, I think many of you know, is, um, is Italian um, Gothic. Below you have this Romanesque, um, Lombard Romanesque style. This is the tomb church. Where we're going is right here. This is the chapel of Mary Magdalene, very close to where the altar is, and the four veils, the infancy narrative uh, painted by Giotto. And we are going to conclude here with Pietro Lorenzetti and his passion, death and resurrection of Jesus, which is actually one of my favorite parts of the whole basilica now. I, I'm, I've just fallen in love with Pietro Lorenzetti. But before we get there, we need to go uh, to Florence because actually, if you go to see David in academia, you um, many people, after they see David, Michelangelo's David, they go through the museum that's uh, are there quickly and they go. This is where this Mary Magdalene master painted this scene. This is also, we can date from the 1260s. And what's very important about this, here you have Mary Magdalene, as many of the paintings, panel paintings of that time have the center figure. There's Claire and Francis are depicted this way. But here you have these scenes of the penitent woman. You've got the raising of Lazarus. You have the Noli Me Tangere scene. This is Easter Sunday. And you have an extraordinary image here of Mary Magdalene preaching, and by the way, I know there's a discussion in the Middle Ages of did Mary Magdalene preach? Well, Jacobus of Virginia and this painting says, yes, um, she does. And then you have these other scenes. This is the bottom scenes are the conflation of Mary Magdalene with Mary of Egypt. And that also appears in the, in the chapel in uh, the Lord Basilica also. This is... Um, this is a thing from the, from the web that I saw that it gives you a clearer image of this, the penitent woman, you've got the raising of Lazarus, you've got the Noli Me Tangere scene, and here she is preaching to the people of Marseille, which is in Southern France. Uh, I just want to show you, I could not find any, anything of the penitent woman, but here you have the raising of Lazarus, you have the, um, the Noli Me Tangere scene, notice the trees and the Flower. This is a sign of life. Jesus holding this cross. We're going to come back to this uh, later. And you have her then preaching. And so this, this is where, I, where we, most art historians believe is the inspiration for what we're going to see. Here's just another scene. I want to emphasize this part of Mary Magdalene preaching to the people. This is from a medieval manuscript. This is actually a painting, if you go into the sacristy of uh, Santa Croce in Florence. This is painted in the later part of the 14th century. And here you have sort of what the Vita Christi tradition picks up. This is this literature written in a Franciscan milieu about the life of Christ and sort of filling in the gaps. Here you have the penitent woman, but here you have now the, the dispute that's in this between Mary and Martha about uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus or working and so forth. Uh, this was very popular in monastic circles. 
because Mary, of course, has cho cho chosen the better part. And then you have the raising of Lazarus. You have a conflation here of the, of the three Marys coming to the tomb, but you also have the Noli Be Tangere scene in a very graphic image of the of, of scene we're going to be looking at shortly. This is a rescue of, of this is actually Mary Magdalene becoming the resurrector. And I'll come back to that, as I said. This is, if you enter into the chapel of Mary Magdalene in the lower basilica, you will see on your left, you will see the scenes of the penitent woman. This is the raising of Lazarus. And then you have Mary receiving communion here for the last time. And then on Easter Sunday, which is very significant, the day of the resurrection. And then she is then transported into, into heaven. On your right, you will see the famous Noli Mi Tangere scene and this jo um, voyage to Marseille. And then you've got her being lifted up, they say, during the canonical hours in the desert. And this is the same, this is the conflation with Mary of Egypt that she, uh, she, is, she rises up every, at every hour by these angels to commune with God. Those paintings are not really significant, but the four lower ones. And for me, when I uh, read Janet Robson's presentation of, of doing this pilgrimage thing, it made me ponder, what is really going on here with these scenes? Why, do, why did Jodhpur School paint these four scenes below? And for me, and uh, this is my interpretation of this, it is going through the medieval triple way. I believe that the friars and these painters knew that what Bonaventure and many others were talking about, is, especially in the Franciscan tradition of, of purgation, illumination, and union. And that's what I believe is going on here. So you begin this with, remember in Luke 7, this penitent, while well, this is about mercy, but in the golden legend, it speaks about in order for Mary to Mary Magdalene to receive that mercy, she must let go of her past, which is the very definition of purgation. That purgation, illumination, and union. Purgation is really, and this is what we're supposed to be doing during Lent, by the way, um, that you are to let go of the past. And so she lets go of of everything there and she receives this mercy and is actually there kissing and anointing the feet of Jesus. So this is her here off centered. You have other scenes from the middle ages that I just wanna show. Here she is sort of in front. Uh, here's another scene of her at the feet. This was, um, this was depicted all over the place in the middle ages, but this comes back. By the way, I'm sorry, uh, the friar that I got these, um, paintings, um, these prints from to create this PowerPoint had a stamp in there and I don't know how to eliminate that. So don't, um, that is not in the original painting I wanna point out. But here you have Mary Magdalene receiving the great compassion of Christ. This is what it's about. And so in terms of purgation, the whole point of purgation is to receive that mercy and to let go of the past. Then you move on, and this is the stage, what I interpret as a stage of illumination. Because what happens here in this scene, here you have Mary Magdalene and Martha, you've got uh, Lazarus being taken out. I have some other images of this. And of course, Jesus in Latin is saying, uh, Lazarus, come out. Remember, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days, signifying he is really dead. And now he is being raised. My point of this is actually to show, and this is what I do more in the uh, book, is to recognize a number of things are going on here. First of all, Mary Magdalene is experiencing the, the compassion. Remember, that if you read the, the whole account of the raising of Lazarus, Jesus is there because of his love for these three siblings. And so it is really about this uh, God's mercy being manifested towards Lazarus. But it's also recognizing here, and this is a point, what I believe of illumination here, it is really of Mary Magdalene 
realizing because illumination is about being filled with something, she is now filled with the knowledge of who this person is. Not only is it the human compassionate person that she's experienced, but it's also one who can raise the dead. And so he has this resurrection power. And so she comes to recognize that it's not simply this human Jesus here, but also the one who is divine and bringing out the divinity and humanity here. This is my interpretation of this, of illumination. And so she is there and she sees this of who he really is. Here's a number of, of these same scenes here. This is Lazarus and, and so forth. Mary Magdalene actually behind. She's always wearing red because of passion. Here's another scene here. Here's Mary Magdalene. They're always below begging for him to release Lazarus. Here's another one. This is actually Duccio, a painter of Siena, which actually has become a really um, dear um, friend to me. I, I just, I really um, have been spending a lot of time with this art and I, I, I feel like I'm channeling them, uh, hopefully, and I'm getting the right interpretation of this. So here we have, once again, this is a close-up of this, of her recognizing who this is. Jesus is the one who has the power to raise the dead. Because right across from this painting, on the other side, so on your left, you would see the penitent woman, you'd see uh, the raising of, of Lazarus. On the other side, right across from it, is the Noli Me Tangere scene. But I want to uh, just mention here, before we get there, that there's a panel painting from the 14th century in which you have Mary Magdalene here at the cross, and here she is here in its... So you have this connection with the cross, Mary being present there, which we know she was, but also Mary, the faithful disciple who remains with Jesus and is rewarded with this experience of the of John 20 of this scene here. And I believe this is one of the most extraordinary paintings here where you've got the two guards here. Remember in that story, Mary, Mary is, um, is questioned by the angels, why is she crying? And then of course, Jesus appears to her as the gardener. And by the way, you, you could see that he is actually holding a gardening tool. Artists, um, medieval historians, art historians will say, it's showing Mary Magdalene seeing Jesus in her perspective, meaning she is seeing a gardener. But now she comes to recognize, of course, that it is of the risen Christ. And so this becomes her moment. And I, I'm, what I, in this book, I, I make the claim that out in the nave of the lower basilica, the, the stigmata of St. Francis for Francis is what the Noli Me Tangere scene is for Mary Magdalene. And we see this uh, in a number of places. This is Giotto in the Arena Chapel, if anyone has been to Padua and goes to, they call it the Arena Chapel or the Scrivani Chapel. There's also a scene here, him carrying this banner of victory and the trees between them, signs of life. These, the soldiers who have been struck down, the two angels and so forth. This is Duccio. Uh, this is incredible sort of painting I've recognized is that when you look at Mary Magdalene, what she's seeing, she can see the face of Jesus. She can see the cross. She can see the banner of victory, but she sees a blooming tree which all are signs of connecting up Good Friday with Easter Sunday, and especially with the resurrection and the new life that comes. This, this tree is dead. This tree is alive. This is medieval symbolism here. But I want to come back to this because um, this scene here is very important because this is the only place I've seen, well, you, there are scenes of the Noli Me Tangere, the Don't Touch Me scene in which Mary Magdalene gets very close to Jesus. Here you have, and this is um, not my own uh, interpretation, but others, but I've sort of expanded on this. What I believe is happening here is that she cannot touch the risen Jesus. 
Because remember, he is in this risen, transformed, spiritualized state that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 15. So she is still here, but she is reaching for him and wants to hold him. And in this context, she is entering, and this is what I find so extraordinary about this, because the sort of the, these rays, this is what I interpret as the energy field that is around Jesus here. So she cannot touch the, the risen Jesus, the body, but she can feel that energy of the resurrection. And so her Easter experience is actually experiencing that new life, that new energy and, and, and so forth. And she's reaching out for that because she wants to hold it. And of course, what Jesus is telling her, you cannot do that here because you're still in this earthly state and I am in this transformed state. I spend a whole chapter in my book about trying to explain this. And also I get into Bonaventure's uh, presentation of this in his commentary on, on John also. But I think this is one of the extraordinary things because also, as you notice, as we saw in an earlier painting here, you've got this new life, the new life that is between them that she is experiencing now. And then we go to the next scene. And this is a scene in which Janet Robson, when she presents what a pilgrim, a pilgrim would do in the, in the 14th century, she leaves this out. And I've always wondered why would they include this scene of, the, of this experience of Mary, Mary Magdalene and Lazarus and, and also Martha and a couple other people go off to Marseille. And here they are in their boat. And here's this woman on this little island. And here's a little boat. You can, um, you can see here they are in the boat. My question is, why are they presenting? Why did Giotto in his school paint this scene? Well, here you have um, another image. This is the one we saw from Florence uh, just a little while ago. Here you have this, the mother and the baby and this ruler. And I'm going to explain what this story is about in a second here. Oops, let me just, let me go back to the painting itself. What this story is, is Mary Magdalene goes there and she starts preaching. And she tries to convert these people, which they consider to be pagans. So um, the, uh, the actual, the, the ruler is more or less convinced. This is from the Golden Legend, by the way. You know, more or less convinced, but he wants to go to Rome to talk to Peter. Because remember, Peter's alive at this time. He has not been crucified upside down as tradition has. And so um, he gets his wife and um, she is pregnant. They start this journey and they don't even go very far at all when she actually dies. And she has this, but she has this baby and she dies. So she gives birth. I should have mentioned it. Gives birth. This baby's alive. And so they go to this island and they, they basically dump the mother and the child off. Without any explanation, this makes no sense, you know, in the real world. But anyway, this is what happens. So this ruler, he goes on to Rome. He goes to, um, to say, um, he doesn't. Um, go to St. Peter's because it didn't exist, but he goes through Rome. He goes through all of these different things. Uh, Peter actually takes him to Jerusalem and so forth. And then on his way back, he decides to stop at this island. When he stops at this island, he sees this little, this little kid. It's better um, in this scene here where you see the little kid that's on the beach. Well, the little kid takes him to the mother who supposedly is still dead here. But they pray to Mary Magdalene and Mary Magdalene through her inspiration or through her prayer, she asked God to raise this woman and she is raised. The thing here is Mary who has had this experience in the garden of, you know, it starts with her experiencing in the raising of Lazarus, Jesus's power to raise the dead. She experiences on Easter Sunday that um, he, is, he is the one who has been raised. Now, like the apostles, Peter and uh, Paul, and actually the apostles, she also becomes a resurrector. In other words, through her intercession, 
she is now uh, becoming, uh, she is one who is in this process of bringing this new life, this resurrection to, to others. So this is my interpretation of those four paintings. Now, as I mentioned, there are these other scenes that are above, but they're really not that important for me because it's really about this, except to say that according to the golden legend in the painting, she did receive communion for the last time on Easter Sunday and she dies. Now, this is 30 years later. And then her soul is then taken up to heaven. And you also have her, this is a scene from the, from the, the desert scene where she has, uh, she's been out there for so long. And by the way, this is the conflation of Mary of Egypt because the same thing happened to Mary of Egypt. She goes on the desert and she's been there so long that her clothes basically um, fall off of her. Uh, and so this uh, priest gives her this new uh, cloak. So that's really not part of my um, interest of the later life of Mary Magdalene. But so um, I wanna move on here, but uh, we're gonna move, um, from out of Mary Magdalene's chapel, Janet Robinson said, you come out here. This is where the infancy narrative is of Giotto. But we're going to be looking at a painting here. And then we're going to go across and look at Pietro Lorenzetti. And here is, if you've been in, this is where the infancy narrative is up above that. Of course, this is uh, Chimabui's uh, famous painting of Mary. What was very significant here is, is that Mary's position here at the cross, she is shown at the cross over and over and over again. So she is present there. Notice that she is not with Mary here. There's gonna be a very a big difference when we get to the other side in Pietro Lorenzetti's scene here. This is just a close up. By the way, you have Francis here and then you have Anthony. These are, I just wanna show you some of the scenes. Mary Magdalene is almost always shown at, at the crucifixion at the, at the, cross, holding on, as you see, holding on, kissing the feet of Jesus almost, um, actually the blood going on to her. This is, you know, there's many scenes of the Middle Ages in which they place her there at the, um, at the cross. What I'm going to take you through is a quick run through of this Pietro Lorenzetti passion um, and resurrection um, a cycle. Because these are the scenes of, of the, of the pre-passion scenes. Because um, I just want to mention, in, um, in uh, Janet Robson's uh, article, she she focuses especially on Judas, and I just want to quickly show those things. Here is Judas. Here, here is Judas. Um, Judas is the one that is, does not, I can't remember where he is. He doesn't have, yes, here's Judas here. He doesn't have a halo. Uh, here is Judas off to the side, no halo. Here is J Judas here, center. He is the betrayer. And of course, we know that Peter Lorenzetti, if you know, uh, you're at that chapel in the far corner is this scene of Judas hanging. He is the symbol of despair. On the other side, where we just were, where the infancy is, you've got, of course, that famous scene of Francis with the skeleton and Francis's victory over this. I could spend time on this, but I, I don't have time to do that. So we come to the, uh, of course, the, the flagellation scene of Jesus here, but here's where it kicks in. Peter learns that he, um, Jesus is on the way to Calvary here, and there you have Mary and, and the two Marys coming together, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother. And this is what I, I emphasize that appears in Vita Christi tradition and in this art. And it's a very beautiful thing about the two Marys coming together. They, here they are, both in the same state of sorrow as, as Jesus is now going to his crucifixion. Now, this is Peter Lorenzetti's, I call this the New York City um, Times Square crucifixion scene, you know, the confusion here. But what's very important here is this scene here. It is the scene of Mary Magdalene and of Mary Magdalene is not at the cross. Mary Magdalene is here with the mother here. And here's a close-up of it. So Mary Magdalene in typically is shown at the cross and not connected up with Mary the mother at all. Here, 
Peter Lorenzetti, Pietro, puts them together in this compassion scene because Mary Magdalene is looking at Mary because they have this relationship of sorrow. They have this relationship of compassion, meaning to suffer with and they're suffering with one another. And that continues on. I just want to show um, there's these usual scenes, as I mentioned, Mary Magdalene's over here, and then you have Mary that is swooning over here. What I want to do in this last, um, these last moments here is to, is to look at these four paintings. You've got the Herring of Hell, you've got the Resurrection, and you have the Deposition, and you have the Burial of Jesus here. These are where the two Marys come together. And here is where you've got these most salvific moments of Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. By the way, in this paintings and in the Vita Christi tradition, they have a very strong um, focus on what happens on Holy Saturday, which is this, what is called the herring of hell or the descent. Jesus goes down and pulls up Adam and supposedly Eve is right here. And all of these other people that hoped I could, um, I'm actually doing a lot of work on the so-called hearing of hell and stuff in the Middle Ages. They really held on to it. I think we've lost it, um, lost that sense. And on the other side, this is one of the, um, this scene of rather than the Noli Mitangere scene, this becomes the major uh, scene in the 14th and 15th centuries to show Jesus has been raised. And so Mary Magdalene sort of gets shoved off to the side here. But what's, what's important is that she does appear below that. She is Mary, the two Marys are below this and providing that, I think, support for them. And here you have Mary, the one who can touch Jesus's face because they share the same flesh. And here you have Mary Magdalene, which quite often in the deposition scene is shown kissing the feet. Of course, this is the same feet she kissed at the, um, the penitent woman of Luke's gospel. This it leads to uh, this great devotion to the man, of the so-called man of sorrows of the later Middle Ages into what is called the Pieta. And of course, um, just course, the famous one that is in uh, St. Peter's of Michelangelo, um, this thing of Mary here. But what's very important about this last scene here is, and this is what the Vita Christi tradition is doing, and also this painting, I believe, is bringing the Marys together. You have Mary Magdalene here, and you have Mary. Uh, the paint, uh, paint, by the way, is um, sort of... Um, not chipped away, but it has sort of disappeared. Um, many things have happened in this basilica and so forth. But you have Mary there that is basically stretched across the body. Remember in the Middle Ages, they understood, and this is part of Mary's assumption also, that Mary's, she shares the same flesh as her son, Jesus. And here you have Mary Magdalene here together. And so the two of them are in this stage of compassionate sorrow for their son. And they also experience, which I end here with this scene here in uh, the one of the, uh, the last chapter that I have in the Vita Christi tradition. And it starts appearing in art of this whole, um, the story of, of Jesus appearing to his mother. But in the Vita Christi tradition, the first appearance was to his mother. But in this Vita Christi tradition, they try to hold those two appearances together. Where you have this first e experience with his mother, and then you have this experience with Mary Magdalene. And what I um, hold out in that is they have this mutual, though different experiences of the risen Jesus. But my contention here is, is that what these artists in the Vita Christi tradition are holding out is Mary is the, is the real disciple. She is the one who has been the faithful one all the way through this, from being the penitent woman, to the raising of Lazarus, to being uh, there at the passion and death of Jesus at the crucifixion, also being there uh, around the time of Holy Saturday, and also being there in the garden. So she is that person who has experienced this, and she also then is the apostle of apostles. She is the one that communicates that to, um, 
to others. And so I end with this, um, this image, which I think is one of the most beautiful paintings here in the Basilica of St. Francis and her, um, it's really a proclamation that she is the main witness to Jesus's resurrection. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Friar Stephen J. McMichael, for your lecture. Seeing the art with your descriptions as you talk through them, just bring that artistry completely to life. I can very much appreciate you. Uh, this opportunity is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology Development Department. Let us please give a collective applause. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, you see my modern, the, uh, the Arezzo cross behind me, but I because I am not only a medievalist, but I'm also a great devotee of a devotee of, uh, of the king of the guitar, Jimmy <laughs> Hendrix, which I saw in concert in 1970. Just throw that in there. Um, <laughs> I live in the modern world. Just, just, <laughs>